Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Mark Erkin, and I want to welcome everybody to our broadcast this morning. I want to officially apologize um, for a one-time event that uh, unfortunately took place last week where our program with uh, Dr. Akira Mayachi was cut off um, at 8.30. Um, as I'm sure many of you heard, heard from us through uh, communications, this was a problem related to the webinar company um, that has not happened in the past seven, seven months. Um, and so I'm hopeful that this will not um, happen again. Uh, we will be airing uh, Dr. Mayachi's uh, presentation along with uh, the discussion um, from uh, Dr. Uh, Libitz, um in Los Angeles um, next Friday, and they all will be available for questions. There were um, a large number of questions that folks had um, tried to get asked or get answered, and we will uh, definitely have an opportunity. Those questions have been saved and they will be our first to pose, but if you have questions related to active surveillance um, and the program from last week, please feel free to, um, uh, to register them uh, for next Friday's presentation. Well, I'm really um, extremely excited and honored to have our two guests this morning. Dr. Rebecca Sippel is the Chief of the Division of Endocrine Surgery and Vice Chair of Academic Affairs and Professional Development at the University of Wisconsin. She is the Program Director for the Endocrine Surgery Fellowship there. Um, Rebecca has uh, held numerous national leadership positions, including past secretary of the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons and the past president of the Association for Academic Surgery. The research study that she will be presenting today is an R01 funded randomized controlled trial um, on which she serves as the PI. And our discussant uh, today is um, a long-term friend and colleague, Dr. Gregory Randolph, who is professor of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and the Claire and John Bertucci Endowed Chair in Thyroid Surgical Oncology at Harvard Medical School. He is the Director of General Otolaryngology Division, as well as uh, the Division of Thyroid and Parathyroid Surgery, operating at both Mass Eye and Ear and Mass General Hospital. Dr. Randolph has directed numerous thyroid and parathyroid courses, both at Harvard as well as international, um, and most recently at the World Congress on thyroid cancer that was conducted in Italy last summer. It seems like a long time ago. Um, Dr. Randolph has two textbooks entitled Surgery of the Thyroid and Parathyroid Glands and the Recurrent and Superior Laryngeal Nerves. Um, are, both of these are invaluable resource for all thyroidologists. And so with that, um, I'm gonna turn this over to Camilo who will um, introduce the first, our question. Uh, we would like to take a poll, but I would like to encourage all of our listeners uh, to go ahead and start um, giving us your questions, and we'll do our best, as usual, to get through those by the end of the hour. So, good morning, everybody. I'm going to present you the case for today. Uh, it's a 490-year-old woman that presents with a neck mass. In ultrasound, the mass was described as a single, solid, hypoechoic nodule, measuring 4.2 by 2.9 by 2.1 centimeters. Well, it was described as wider than tall and it had smooth, smooth mar margins. The patient underwent FNA biopsy and then was reported suspicious for malignancy or Bethesda 5. On ultrasound, no clinical, clinically suspicious lymph nodes were identified. And uh, based on the above characteristics, which of the following would you suggest as initial treatments for this patient? So we have four options for you uh, underneath. So you will we'll show you the poll, which are thyroid lobectomy, thyroid total thyroidectomy, total thyroidectomy with prophylactic central neck dissection, and total thyroidectomy with possible central neck if clinically evident nodal disease is identified intraoperatively. Great. 
Rebecca, I think um, we're all set to go here. All right, great. Can you guys see my screen okay? All set. Okay, perfect. Um, well, I just want to thank Dr. Erkin uh, for the opportunity to present this. Um, and you know, as he said, this is a, a randomized controlled clinical trial that I have been working on, I feel like, for almost my entire career. Um, I think the lesson I've learned through this is that the challenges of doing a prospective randomized clinical trial, um, especially one on, on a disease that has outcomes that may take many, many years in order to, to evaluate. Um, Um, so I don't have any financial disclosures uh, for this presentation. And uh, this is the reference. Um, I didn't put references on all the slides because all the references are related to the article that we're presenting today. Um, and this uh, application was, uh, was going to be presented at the American Surgical Association in the spring, which of course, because of COVID did not happen, uh, but was published in the American Surgical uh, uh, issue of the Annals of Surgery uh, just this month in September of 2020. So if we think about the treatment of papillary thyroid cancer, our historical standard was a total thyroidectomy. Um, but we know that lymph node involvement is common. And I think we all agree that if it's macroscopic disease, we should probably resect the disease. But the question always becomes is what if it's microscopic? What do we do with this microscopic lymph node involvement? We know that it's common. And there's been studies that have shown that it's probably present in 60 to 80% of patients if we look and we remove the lymph nodes. And I think the challenge is, is that when we think about it, is that the survival of thyroid cancer is excellent. We know that for most of these patients, this is a low-grade malignancy, and it's unlikely to limit their life. But we do know that despite that excellent survival, that recurrence is a frequent challenge, and that it is very difficult to ever tell one of these patients that you are cured and you never have to worry about this. I always tell patients that this is really slow growing, and so we can tell you that you're at low risk of recurrence, but we can really never use the word cured for thyroid cancer. So the problem with the treatment of papillary thyroid cancer is that imaging often misses microscopic lymph node in, uh, involvement. Um, and the question is, is if it's so small, you can't see it on imaging, what's the, you know, is it of any clinical significance? Does it really matter? Does it matter if we don't know it's there? If we can't even see it, it's probably insignificant. And I think the question has become is when we find this is what if we did more surgery? If we did more surgery and we remove this microscopic disease at the time of the initial surgery, could it decrease recurrence? You know, could it make these outcomes better for the patients in the long term? Or is it going to simply increase the risks? And I think that this is at the heart of the debate of sort of how to manage uh, the initial management of papillary thyroid cancer. And for any of us that have practiced over the years, we have seen these swings, right? I feel like as, as, a, as a group of people caring for these patients, we swing to being more aggressive. And then after a few years, we realize that maybe that was too far and then we become less aggressive. And it kind of swings back and forth because I think ultimately we recognize that it's always a balance between these two issues. So what was the rationale for my study? You know, I think what triggered me to want to do this project was that in 2006, the American Thyroid Association guidelines for the treatment of thyroid nodules and cancer were published, and they put in a recommendation that routine central neck uh, compartment to neck dissection should be considered for patients with papillary thyroid carcinoma. And I thought this recommendation was based on retrospective data and expert opinion. And for any of you who remember what happened when these were published, it created a firestorm and a lot of controversy amongst those practicing thyroid surgery. You know, I think the, the concern was is that yes, we know that microscopic disease is there, but do we really know that by removing it, we're helping patients and what are the risks? And are we exposing patients to unnecessary risks? What I saw very quickly happen when this came out is that this was adopted pretty wide across the country that everybody jumped on the bandwagon and started doing prophylactic central neck dissections. And I just thought we are doing this you know, prematurely without the evidence to really support that this is appropriate care. And that's what triggered me to wanna to write the grant to get this randomized controlled trial funded. I felt like the benefits of prophylactic central neck dissection, I did not think were really proven. And if they were there, I think they were likely small. But I thought the risk of central neck dissection are real. And I think if we look at the literature, complications of thyroid surgery are historically underreported because most reportings are surgeon self-report. And if you've ever talked to a surgeon, we never have complications. And so I think that the reliability of, of surgeon reported outcomes after thyroid surgery are always underreporting complications. 
I also think that they're from a medical perspective. We're not asking the patients. You know, we might say, oh, everything is great. You never had a complication. But if we talk to the patient, they may not agree. And I also think that when we look at some of these complications, while, you know, the, the disease may not limit their life, these complications can have a really major impact on patients' quality of life. And for a disease that isn't gonna limit their quality of life, especially in a young person, to give them a complication that has a major impact on their overall quality of life for the rest of their life, you know, has, has a significant consequence. So I think it's really important that we balance those risks and benefits. So the aim of this study was that we would evaluate the risks and benefits of a prophylactic central neck dissection in patients with clinically N0 papillary thyroid cancer. So our study design is that we wanted to identify patients who had clinical N0 thyroid cancer. So they were adult patients, and they had to have a biopsy that was diagnostic or suspicious of cancer, and we only included patients who had a cancer greater than one centimeter but they had to have no evidence of lymph node metastases on a neck ultrasound. So every patient had a comprehensive neck ultrasound and it was reviewed by an expert radiologist to confirm that there really was no disease there. And they had to have no evidence of distant disease or other active malignancy. We did the randomization actually in the operating room and we thought that that was important because one, if the biopsy was just suspicious and not diagnostic, we had to confirm the diagnosis of cancer. So we had to do a frozen section in the operating room. Um, we also had to confirm that there was no lymph node disease identified intraoperatively, because we all know that even when we have a negative ultrasound, occasionally intraoperatively, you will find something that looks suspicious. So if at any point during the surgery, the surgeon felt that a lymph node dissection was indicated, they would never randomize the patient. But they would have the envelope in the room, and if after removing the thyroid and evaluating the central neck, they felt there was no evidence of nodal disease and they would otherwise not do a lymph node dissection, then they would open the envelope and they would be randomized. And they would be randomized to ending the operation with just the total thyroidectomy or doing an ipsilateral central neck dissection. We confirmed the adequacy of the central neck dissection by having another study surgeon come in and evaluate the dissection field and make sure it was comprehensive or they had to take a picture of the operative bed and text it to, to me, who was the PI, to evaluate the, the section and ensure that it was done adequately. And then what we did is we looked at a bunch of study outcomes. We looked at obviously complication rates after surgery. We wanted to look at cancer outcomes. We recognized it may not be powered to look at that, but wanted to track that. And more importantly, wanted to look at the impact on quality of life. So our study population uh, was 60 patients who had clinical N0 papillary thyroid cancer, and they were randomized to a total thyroidectomy plus or minus a central neck dissection. In order to evaluate the difference between these, we thought it was really essential that we standardize treatment and follow up for the course of one year. So we saw all these patients preoperatively two weeks, six weeks, six months, and one year, and they all got a standardized regimen as far as treatment and follow up. So how did we assess complications in quality of life? Everybody got a pre and post operative comprehensive voice evaluation that included a laryngoscopy, video stroboscopy. Um, it, it was probably the most comprehensive voice evaluation you can imagine. They also got dedicated swallow studies, video swallows. We also did calcium and PTH testing in the PACU right after surgery at two weeks and then at six months. We documented their calcium or calcitriol consumption. They had log books where they logged their symptoms, the severity and the frequency, and how much medication they had to consume. We also gave them validated quality of life questionnaires. We did some global quality of life questionnaires, the SF12 and the global ER2C. Um, we also did the a thyroid cancer specific quality of life instrument, and then the EAT10, which is a swallow uh, questionnaire, and the VHI, which is a voice handicap index. We also did uh, semi-structured interviews that were focused on the patient experience. And these interviews were done at each of the five time points and, and it lasted about an hour. We had trained interviewers who uh, interviewed each of the patients, talked specifically about their experience and their symptoms, especially symptoms potentially related to complications. And those were all transcribed and then coded uh, and put into en vivo uh, for, for us to do further analysis. So for anybody who's familiar with qualitative research, we have over 251 hour transcribed interviews as part of the study. So we we just have a massive qualitative data set. We also wanted to assess cancer outcomes. Uh, because when we started the study, radioactive iodine was pretty standard of care at our institution, we decided that in order to evaluate the impact of central neck, we had to standardize radioactive iodine treatment. If we look at all the retrospective studies, you can see that anytime you do a central neck dissection and you find nodal disease, 
you treat with more radioactive iodine. And so then that always skews any comparison between the groups, because if you can't control for the administration of radioactive iodine, you can never really evaluate the impact of surgery. So we decided to just make it standard that everybody would get routine ablation with 50 millicuries. Um, Unfortunately, as you know, the, the second American Thyroid Association guidelines that came out halfway through this study said that radioactive iodine wasn't indicated for low-risk patients. Uh, and I think that that's appropriate, but it's hard when you're doing a randomized controlled study. Um, so we decided that if by chance the tumor turned out to be nine millimeters on final pathology, you know, they could opt out of, of radioactive iodine or if they had what we defined as an excellent response to therapy. So we used the definition of the ATA guidelines. And if we felt that they met that right after surgery alone, they would not be required to get the radioactive iodine. We also then got unstimulated uh, thyroglobulin levels at six weeks, six months, and one year. And then thyrogen stimulated thyroglobulin levels at six weeks and one year. And then neck ultrasounds at six months and one year. So this is the patient and tumor characteristics, um, and the groups were pretty similar at baseline. Um, they were mostly women, you know, they were in their you know, average age of about 40 to 50. Uh, the tumor size was about two centimeters in size on average, um, and about 40% of patients had mul multifocal disease, and extrathyroidal extension was present in between 10 to 15% of patients. And these patients were block randomized based on tumor size and age. And we did that because we felt those were the two factors that would be most likely to impact outcomes in these patients to try to assume that these groups would be similar at baseline. So I just want to talk a little bit about the lymph node findings. So if we look at the number of lymph nodes removed, you know, people who had a central neck dissection had an average of seven lymph nodes removed, which is pretty typical for a unilateral central neck dissection. But the interesting thing is even in the total thyroidectomy patients where there was no intention to do a central neck dissection, we found incidental thyroid uh, uh, lymph nodes attached to the thyroid in many of the cases. And interestingly, when we looked at the presence of positive lymph nodes, those who had a total thyroidectomy, 10% of them actually had a, a, a node attached to the specimen that had a small focus of cancer. In the central neck dissection group, however, uh, it was about 28% of patients that ended up having positive lymph node disease. But as expected, because these truly were prophylactic, the average size or the largest lymph node that we found was in a three to four millimeter size. So this was all truly microscopic disease. And if we look at the number of lymph nodes that were positive, you know, it was only about one to two out of the patients that were randomized to the central neck dissection. So I think you can summarize this, that the, the nodes were present in about 28% of patients, but only 10% of the new nodes that were removed actually had any disease in it. And almost all that disease was microscopic and was well below the one centimeter threshold. So these truly were prophylactic central neck dissections. The first thing we wanted to look at was postoperative complications. And um, we put it into these three main categories. One was a vocal fold paresis, and this was confirmed by laryngoscopy. Um, we put in a category of other vocal fold changes because I think what we realized is that on a video laryngoscopy, you can see some subtle changes. It's not truly a paresis. The cord is moving, but it doesn't move exactly normal. And so I put those as other vocal fold changes. Um, and then postoperative PTH less than 10. And that was the definition that we chose to use for transient hypoparathyroidism. And the reason we picked that is because it was a clear numeric value that could be obtained the day of surgery. And it wasn't going to be confounded by the fact that they were taking medications uh, that might have impacted, you know, whether they were symptomatic or whether or not they needed supplementation. And when we looked at these results, what I was surprised is that the complication rates were much higher than I expected in both groups. Um, you know, part of what that lesson is, is when you look and you look really carefully, it's always higher than you expect. And I think that that, again, sort of highlights the fact of surgeon self-reporting of complications. You know, I think um, everyone thinks they have lower complication rates than they actually do. Um, the interesting thing is we also found that there was no difference between groups. We expected the central neck dissection group to have much higher complication rates. We did more dissection. We dissected out the nerve. People knew their outcomes were being analyzed, so they were being very meticulous, but it didn't impact our complication rates. But the interesting thing that we found was the, the exact opposite. In fact, the complications trended higher in the total thyroidectomy group uh, in all the complications. 
The next thing we wanted to look at was short-term cancer outcomes. And so, you know, how do you define this? We couldn't obviously in a five-year study do long-term outcomes and recurrence. So we wanted to look at what are those surrogate markers that we use immediately after surgery to assess response to therapy and determine outcomes. And so we looked at a six-week thyroglobulin level less than 0.2, um, a, a six-week thyroglobulin, you know, less than 0.2 or a stimulated less than one, a six-month TG, a one-year TG, a stimulated TG, basically every cutoff of thyroglobulin that you can in the first year. And what we found is that there was no difference between either groups in any of these numbers. The outcomes were basically equivalent across the board, no matter how we measured it or how we tried to define a short-term cancer outcome. And so I think the take home was, is that at least within the first year that our early tumor markers and our response to initial therapy was really equivalent in both groups. The next thing we wanted to do is because some of the patients did not get the radioactive iodine and we wanted to try to look at that response to initial therapy. And so this came out in the most recent ATA guidelines, sort of defining that excellent response to therapy. That's obviously what we ideally want to get every patient to. If we can get them to an excellent response to therapy, we know we have the lowest risk of recurrence in the long term. And what we found is that groups were equally likely to achieve an excellent response to therapy at one year. Um, basically 80% of patients in both groups achieved that excellent response to therapy. What we found is though uh, that between, you know, about 20% of those patients had an indeterminate response. And so what's an indeterminate response? It's those nonspecific findings on imaging, um, you know, maybe it's post-operative change, maybe it's scarring, keep an eye on it. Um, a detectable thyroglobulin, but it was less than one, so a TG of 0.2 or 0.3. A stimulated TG that was less than 10 or stable or declining thyroglobulin antibodies. And so these rates were similar between our total thyroidectomy and our total thyroidectomy and central neck dissection. But I think the unknown of this study is that we don't know what that means. And I think that in long-term follow-up, we really have to see is what does this indeterminate response mean? And does this actually translate in five years or 10 years to clinically significant recurrence? And I think that that's gonna be an important part and we're gonna try to maintain follow-up of this cohort to sort of see what happens to those patients over time. The other thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to look at quality of life. And so this is just an example of one of the global quality of life measures, the global quality of life from the ERTC and a thyroid cancer specific quality of life instrument that we did. And if we look at the global quality of life from the ERTC, we see that you know, both groups actually saw a small improvement at one year. We hear all this talking about how thyroid cancer is negative on quality of life for patients, but the interesting thing is that in our patients, everybody was actually better a year later than they were at baseline. Um, but what we saw is, is that they were above the population norm and that the groups were incredibly similar, that there really was no difference whether they had gotten a central neck dissection or not. If we look at the thyroid cancer specific quality of life, obviously this is a little bit more sensitive to the issues specific to the, uh, these patients with uh, thyroid cancer. And what we saw is that they had similar variability between groups, um, that there often was initial decline, especially in the first six weeks to six months as they're getting adjusted on thyroid hormone replacement and they're recovering from complications, but then that starts to return to baseline by one year. So in summary, I think you know, patients with a clinically N0 papillary thyroid cancer were treated with either a total thyroidectomy or a total thyroidectomy and central neck dissection had similar complication rates after surgery. And while we did find microscopic nodes in about 28% of the central neck dissection patients, you know, the out oncologic outcomes were really comparable at one year. And so I think while the risk of performing a central neck dissection were not higher in the study, you know, I think the caveat is, is that this was done at a tertiary care center by expert surgeons. Um, I think we still couldn't prove the benefit of performing a central neck dissection. It just wasn't clinically evident at one year. I think the interesting part of this is that 20% of patients in both groups had indeterminate lab or imaging findings at one year. And I think it's gonna be really important that we follow those patients long-term because it may translate into higher long-term recurrence rates. Uh, and I think it warrants ongoing study. I'd just like to acknowledge uh, grants that supported this work. Um, my co-PI, Nadine Connor, who's a PhD speech language pathologist, and our study coordinator, Sarah Robbins, 
um, as well as uh, the Voice and Swallow Clinic uh, at UW Health, Dr. David Francis, a laryngologist who helped to evaluate all the video laryngoscopies and all these patients for consistency, and our qualitative health consultants, um, Dr. Cameron McDonald, um, and all the endocrinologists and surgeons who helped to recruit to the study and help to care for the patients involved in this. And the many students, fellows, and researchers and staff over the course of the last seven years who have helped to move this project forward. Um, be happy to answer questions, but I think uh, we're going to switch over to Dr. Randolph and then we'll open up for questions at the end with both of us. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. That was uh, that's really a heroic uh, scientific effort, and I congratulate you and your coworkers for doing it. Really necessary, necessary work, and um, I'm very, very pleased and honored to discuss this. I'd like to thank Mark and and thank for uh, Mark your inspiring um, devotion to thank and to the thyroid cancer space to Erica Rauscher for her work in THANK and also Ariana Shari for her coordination of all of this. It's made it very, very easy to get involved. So I, I want to, um, uh, let's see here. Um, <clears throat> I want to just go through uh, some, uh, some details here. Let's see, can I, there we go. Uh, so th this study, really a heroic study uh, over a long period of time, tremendous effort, wonderful science, and basically randomizing to with or without clinically uh, node negative patients with or without central neck dissection. Uh, as Rebecca mentioned, I'm not going to go into the details of the study. She did a beautiful job reviewing that. Seven nodes removed in the central neck and about one node removed uh, in the just thyroidectomy group. But here, I think, is probably the key message here is that, as she mentioned, the, the nodes that were removed in the central neck, this is clearly like the definition of microscopic disease. So it's you, the, the, what this study did, what a prophylactic central neck dissection is supposed to do is harvest at most microscopically positive nodes. So the size of the node, I think, is the real important thing here. The other second point after size is the complications. And we're talking about a RLN paralysis or paresis rate of nearly 12% postoperatively, and at six weeks, nearly 4%, with parathyroid PTH levels less than 10 in almost 30%. And with that being persistent at six months in about 15%. So, you know, there, there are, as Rebecca said, you know, when you really study this and pass the patient through a, a fine filter postoperatively of, of tremendously delicate, accurate, high acuity analysis, you find these complications. Uh, so I, I see that these two the two main issues of Rebecca's wonderful work relates to size and complications. And so let's just talk a little bit about size and what, um, if we can stratify, when we think about a positive node, we, we have to now think about, is it microscopic or macroscopic? We can't just think about positive nodes, yes or no. So here are nine studies looking at the rates at which microscopic nodal disease is found should one perform prophylactic neck dissection. And so Rebecca's study was a little bit more towards the lower end uh, of this. The, the, there are studies showing as high as almost 80% rate of microscopic positive nodes if a prophylactic neck dissection is done for papillary thyroid carcinoma. So the microscopic nodal disease, as Rebecca mentioned, is there it's very highly prevalent. What is this microscopic nodal disease? As in Rebecca's study, this is really, you know, several millimeter focus of disease in a node, which is to the surgeon's eye and to preoperative radiographic analysis, negative, right? So this is, you submit that node to pathologic evaluation, there is a microscopic focus of, of disease in that. Now, if you look at macroscopic, nodal disease. First of all, what, what is that? So clinically apparent is the kind of term in the ATA guidelines that has been pushed forward. 
clinically apparent microscopic nodal disease, that which is either palpable occasionally in bulky nodal disease or evident preoperatively on radiographic studies, ultrasound and sometimes CT scan, or that which is grossly recognized at surgery as abnormal. That third one is the least clear definition, but those are the three main elements of that which makes nodal disease clinically apparent and macroscopic. So studies are showing that that occurs in about a third of patients with papillary carcinoma, much higher prevalence of clinically inapparent micrometastasis for papillary carcinoma. So that's the landscape. So we've talked about, you know, well, we can, like last week's um, um, webinar, looked at primary disease in the thyroid. You can talk about a low-risk primary. You can talk about a microcarcinoma that could be observed. So can we have the same conversation? Should we evolve that conversation to involve the other station of, meta, of, of papillary disease in the nodal beds? And so can you have low risk nodal beds? So, you know, just like the pigs in, in, in animal farm, you know, not all nodes are created equal. There are some that are more equal. Not all positive nodes are created equal. Some are more equal. And so let's talk about how size can help us with that. And this was a paper back in 2012 that led to some of the uh, elements in the subsequent 2015 guidelines that looked at what is you know, if nodes, if positive nodes are bad, if they have prognostic significance, let's stratify that relative to size. And so we looked at the world's literature and we looked at these three groups, clinical N0 disease, patients who had clinical N0 disease but had a prophylactic neck dissection and had microscopic nodal disease identified and then patients who had macroscopic nodal disease and underwent a therapeutic dissection. And then we looked at you know, the typical prognostic downside of having a positive node, which is the rate of nodal recurrence, typically not in most age groups relative to survival decrement, but it, it nodes beget nodes. So in each of these groups, the first two microscopic disease that in the first group is not operated on, but present, the, those that are um, microscopically positive and those that have a therapeutic dissection for macroscopic nodal disease. And here are the rates based on the world's literature at that review that whether you operate on microscopic disease or not, the rate of recurrence is, is not substantially different. This is different than the rate of nodal recurrence if you are operating therapeutically on a macroscopically positive nodes. They diverge. So the one downside of having a node positive, that is that it kicks up the rate of subsequent nodal recurrence, does not apply to microscopically positive nodes. So this is the element in the 2015 guidelines that were discussed. And so this, this idea that we want to then if it's large nodes, that is those that are apparent on the physical exam, those that are apparent radiographically, those that are grossly apparent at surgery, then what we wanna do is preoperatively try and map out those nodes uh, and, and then base your neck dissection with therapeutic intent towards those clinically apparent nodal, uh, nodal disease. And so this Recommendation 32 in the 2015 guidelines suggests that ultrasound, as we all know, is the primary tool to determine uh, whether there is clinically apparent radiographically suspect uh, uh, radiographic disease, uh, clinically apparent radiographic disease. And so the recommendation 32 suggests we move forward with a preoperative nodal map. That this has great utility to know what you're doing before the surgery. It is objective. It can be shared and discussed with not just the patient, but also the referring endocrinologist. And it can serve as a baseline reference for why you did or didn't dissect a given compartment. It's based on the pragmatic real-time data based on preoperative radiographic analysis. So for me, I apply both ultrasound and CAT scan to this nodal map. And so I basically find where the radiographically clear-cut suspicious nodes are. 
and I dissect those compartments, those four subcompartments of the central neck and the two lateral neck compartments, and I do not dissect the compartments that do not contain radiographic disease. So my dissection is not based on my philosophy. I like to do a central neck dissection or don't. It's also not based on the patient's risk, has a BRAF positive tumor, and so I do or don't do a central neck. It's based not on philosophy, not on risk analysis. It's based on what that patient has prior to surgery based on radiographic reality. And so again, the uh, tool for this primarily is ultrasound, but there has been a move towards the inclusion of cross-sectional imaging including CAT scan with contrast in certain um, preoperative scenarios. The ATA suggests invasive primary tumor or large clinically apparent multiple or bulky nodes initially identified on ultrasound. You are permitted then to further evaluate that extent of disease with a CAT scan with contrast, even though that may alter the timing of the subsequent RAI. This is also true, this same microscopic versus macroscopic stratification of positive nodes, not all nodes are equal, applies to recurrent nodes where also cross-sectional imaging is permitted in certain recurrent nodal disease uh, scenarios. And the recommendation here uh, for recurrent nodal disease uh, is eight millimeter in the central neck and 10 millimeter in the lateral neck is defined as permissible to at least consider surgical intervention. This is titrated by a lot of other parameters. If the disease is only on a, is on a only functioning nerve, if there is a rapidly growing CNS metastasis, you know, then you would not act on this. But the reason why these were chosen, eight and 10 millimeters, is these are the limits we think that a combined ultrasound and CT scan mapping functionality preoperatively can localize and detect these foci of disease and would permit a surgical uh, consideration. So the second issue then after size is, let's look frankly at what do we engender when we operate on these patients. And so I, I just wanted to mention that some of these things about uh, thyroid surgical complications are, are still unclear, I think, to, to uh, our surgical community. And I'm a fan of Megan Haymart's work. And she's shown some information looking at a SEER database that looks at complications. And, and these are some very interesting um, correlates of complications. So those patients who have, and, and when I, the, the, the boxes to the right, thyroid-specific complications, these are nerve and parathyroid complications. So one of the correlates, which is peculiar but worth thinking about, is those patients who present with distant metastasis have a they are one of the hotspots in thyroid nerve and parathyroid complications. If you look at patients over 65, they are another hotspot which harbor a very high percentage of these are again these are not mi and stroke this is nerve and parathyroid thyroid specific complications and if you look at those patients with comorbidities unrelated to the thyroid surgical bed there is another hotspot of nerve and parathyroid complications so if you look at the, you know, the, the nerve and parathyroid, scylla and charybdis of thyroid complications, let's get a little granular into some of those things. So we found for parathyroid function, uh, Rebecca found you know, less than 10 PTH in 28% of patients. So this is, there are other references we can look at to look at, here's one recent reference looking at rates of hypopara in a Taiwan database and here also that in terms of hypopara in the first period of time, uh, you know, that, that it, within the first 12 months, we're talking about three to 5% of patients with hypopara. If you look at national databases globally, it is not uncommon to have double digit patients after total thyroidectomy with permanent hypoparathyroidism. And as Rebecca said, and, and as I also admit, well, if you talk to us, we, we never have complications, uh, but there are organizations whose membership rosters 
consist of patients whose surgery, our surgeries, have rendered permanently hypopara. So if we were as good as we often say we are, these organizations would not exist, and they do exist. They exist all around the world. So what is the consequence of this parathyroid set of complications? And Anders Bergenfeld has shown this recently with Martin Almquist. There is a, with permanent hypopara, there is a five-fold increased risk of renal insufficiency. With permanent hypopara, there is a two-fold increase of risk for any malignancy development in follow-up, and there is an increased risk of cardiovascular events as well with a hazard ratio of 1.88. If we look at not just morbidity, but mortality, the same authors have investigated this, and permanent hypoparathyroidism results in a two-fold increase in mortality in long-term follow-up. So this parathyroid set of problems that we give patients with aggressive surgery has its impact. So now let's end with looking at the nerve. And Neil Tully, I think, has done the best work looking at what is the consequence of these rates of nerve paralysis, looking at big data in the UK. And again, nerve paralysis in the early post-op period in Rebecca's study, nearly 12%, 3.4% at six weeks. So Neil's work in the UK looked at a large data set, over 43,000 patients. ER readmission increased with unilateral vocal cord paralysis. Subsequent admission for lower respiratory tract infection increased with unilateral cord paralysis. The reporting of dysphagia, as Rebecca study de uh, designates, increased with unilateral cord paralysis. And tracheotomy increased with cord paralysis. And most importantly, mortality increased. And so really this relates in turn to Megan's work looking at, you know, if you have an elderly patient with a unilateral cord paralysis and comorbidities and then starts aspirating, this perhaps is the hotspot of mortality on a population level looking at these patients. So we've, we've really, I think Rebecca's work is outstanding and I congratulate her for this. The, the hotspots of important information for surgeons, I think, is that not all nodes are equal and size matters. We should apply therapeutic dissection for clinically apparent nodal disease, and we can let the microscopic disease go by the wayside, and that we have to have a sober understanding of the complications and their morbidity and mortality, both para and nerve, that we engender with our surgery. So I wanna welcome you to the Harvard course. We will have this as a virtual course uh, just next month in November, and we will also be having our World Congress as Mark mentioned it will be postponed uh, till 2022 and will be in Boston. I want to thank Mark again and his team and Rebecca for her wonderful work and thank you very much for your attention. So hi everybody. We'll, we're going to go back to the to the full slide. Um, about this 48-year-old uh, woman with a, a single solid mass missing 4.2 by 2.9 by 2.1, smooth margins, biopsy to Bethesda 5, an ultrasound, no clinically suspicious lymph nodes were identified. And based on those characteristics, we would ask you again, which would be your initial uh, suggestion for surgical treatment? So the, op the options will show up in, the, in your screen in a second, so you can all um, to give us your answer. <clears throat> Terrific. Well, thank you. Um, thank you both for uh, a really outstanding discussion of this really important topic. Um, so obviously, long-term assessment of this um, cohort of patients, Rebecca, will be important. Um, and uh, some of our questions relate to what your plans are 
um, how much, uh, whether your funding will permit long-term analysis of this group to assess more than a, um, the one-year follow-up of recurrent disease. Maybe if you could just comment on that. Yeah, I think that um, obviously the funding is a five-year time period. So the patients enrolled in the first year, we have four years of follow-up, um, but those enrolled in the last year, we don't. Um, but I just have the intention, uh, regardless of the NIH funding ending, of just following this cohort as long as I can. Um, I think the patients were very engaged and I'm hopeful that they will continue to keep in contact with us so that we can track their outcomes for five and 10 years. Terrific. Um, and could you please, um, maybe Greg and um, Rebecca, both of you can comment, what will it take for us to put this issue uh, completely to rest? Or do you feel that we're at that point here? You know, I, I think it, you know, I remember when I was in training with Dr. Clark, he said that, you know what, what happens with the field of thyroid cancer is we swing one way and then we swing back the opposite direction and then we come back. And this happens about every 10 to 20 years in our practice. And, and it's true. I think that, you know, when this started, it was because we were swinging to being way too aggressive. And now we've swung probably to being not aggressive enough. Um, and so I think ultimately we have to find that happy medium. And I think, you know, as, as Greg highlighted, I think one of the key things is this is all about the quality of preoperative neck ultrasound. Um, if you do not have high quality neck ultrasound, then these aren't really prophylactic neck dissections. You're missing clinically significant disease. And I think that that's why our rate of prophylactic or positive nodes was lower than some of the published literature is because I think we actually had very high ultrasound quality and a lot of people weren't eligible because they ended up getting the therapeutic neck dissection because disease was evident. So I do think that that's part of it. I, you know, I would say that as I come out of this study, you know, not that it's supposed to be the take home of this, but I feel like as we've pushed to doing more thyroid lobectomies, you know, I honestly question whether or not the right answer to this is maybe doing a thyroid lobe with a central neck dissection. Because I do think that if you could take out half the thyroid and preserve natural thyroid function, and then if those nodes are all negative, you can feel pretty reassured that the patient probably doesn't need radioactive iodine and can be safely monitored with ultrasound and is at very low risk. But if I did the central neck dissection and 10 of 10 nodes were positive, I probably wouldn't feel comfortable doing just a lobe and I might wanna consider a completion thyroidectomy or additional treatment. Um, Cause I feel like the information that we've gotten, cause I historically had not done prophylactic neck dissections is that sometimes that information when you did it and it all came back negative, you felt very comfortable skipping radioactive iodine and knowing that that patient's very low risk versus if they all came back positive, it does shift your thoughts about the disease status. So, you know, that, that can be the next study. Uh, we can see if, if that study is the, the way we should be going in the future. Yes, I, I agree. Uh, I think that we have been through a long sequence of varying surgical offerings based on different opinions as to what we thought was best. You know, our Asian co-workers in Japan uh, would offer in the past something quite similar to what Rebecca just mentioned, that is a lobe and a partial limited lateral neck dissection because microscopic disease is often there and, th and, and their outcomes were quite good. So they kind of disregarded microscopic disease or multifocal disease that could be in the opposite lobe, and they got away with it. But they regarded the lateral neck microscopic disease and felt that was important to encompass. Um, we will have always been much more focused on a kind of a total thyroidectomy approach. So I think you know we we know what we know at a certain time frame. You know the the swing that Rebecca described from the 26 to uh, subsequent ATA guidelines was with the best of intentions. It was a recognition that there's nodal disease that was there, and we thought it was best to encompass it in in a dissection. That's quite a reasonable thought, but we have to learn. And I think Rebecca's study helps us get to that point. It's a very high quality science response that we don't, that they are there, that's true, but unexpectedly they have no consequence. And we have more harm than benefit by pursuing them aggressively the way we would do with typical clinically apparent nodes. So I think, um, you know, we, we just need to accept that at any one time, we only know what we know, but I think we do have to use Rebecca's study and hard work to progress to a new plane. We now understand that we don't need to pursue this disease aggressively. So let me um, thank you, 
uh, let me just ask, are there any characteristics of the primary tumor um, that uh, whether it be preoperative uh, molecular analysis, um, harboring higher risk mutations or intraoperative findings that would drive your decision to perform at the very, at least a unilateral prophylactic central node dissection. Um, and so, or if you don't see them, you don't feel them, um, that's, uh, that's the end of the game here. Yeah, I would say that um, we tried to include a large tumor size and more advanced tumors in our study um, just to try to help address that question. We just didn't have a ton of patients enrolled in those categories. I do think that if there is extrathyroidal extension, I would not feel comfortable doing the lobe. I know that that patient is going to likely get radioactive iodine. I would, I think those are patients that may benefit uh, from a prophylactic central neck dissection. I think from molecular testing, um, you know, we don't routinely get it on patients who have a biopsy that's diagnostic of PTC. But I do envision that the future in how we decide who gets a lobe versus who gets a total versus who gets a total with the central neck should probably be based on the molecular profiling. If we could, instead of knowing that this is a papillary thyroid cancer, this is a papillary thyroid cancer with, that's going to behave aggressively, and we could know that up front, those are probably patients that probably would benefit from a prophylactic central neck dissection. So I think right now we're using molecular diagnostics to, to decide whether or not they have cancer, but I really think the future needs to be to guide our surgical decision making, to decide who's an appropriate candidate for a lobe and who really needs that central neck dissection. Greg, if, yes, you, have a, if you have a I patient. agree. I, I, I'm hoping that there are oncogenic uh, alterations that are in the future elucidated that show, you know, this, the nodal metastasis gene is turned on. I, I, I would just caution, though, that right now it would be lovely and simple for surgeons to say BRAF positive, we should therefore do a central neck dissection, and the data is fairly clear that that is not sufficient information on which to base really any significant clinical decision, including the inclusion of a prophylactic neck dissection in someone who harbors a negative ultrasound. And that is uh, salt and peppered through the ATA 2015 guidelines that BRAF alone is not sufficient to guide you in that decision making. Great. Let me see if I can get to some of uh, the questions from our um, attendees here. Uh, Dr. Chen has asked the question, um, if there is evidence of a micromet in a central lymph node, does this mean that you should give radioactive iodine? And is there a magic number of micromets to drive that radioactive iodine decision? So I don't think there's a magic number, and I think that that's, that's our bias, right? I think that's why when we look at retrospective studies, there's always a bias to more aggressively treat with radioactive iodine when there's micromets. I think if it's truly micromets, you know, one of the things that we look at is the lymph node ratio. What was positive versus what was been removed? If it's two lymph nodes and eight were, you know, out of 10 and eight are negative, I feel like we probably did an adequate lymph node dissection and they could actually um, avoid radioactive iodine. So I think one of the greatest advantages of potentially doing a prophylactic central neck dissection is we could actually minimize our use of radioactive iodine, not increase. Um, so I don't think, you know, I think where I would worry about it is if we had eight of eight lymph nodes that are positive. Um, I would want to look really carefully at the lateral neck because I would worry that maybe the disease was further spread than we appreciated. But those are the patients that I think probably likely have residual microscopic disease and would benefit. Um, so Dr. Davies has asked um, a, uh, a question at 10,000 feet, um, and that is, how do we improve surgical techniques to, re to reduce the high complication rates? You know, I, I think that's a great question. I think that obviously, um, you know, not everybody can do thyroid surgery um, perfectly. And so I think recognizing that this is a technically a difficult operation and that to do a good cancer operation and to do a good cancer operation safely requires an expert skill set. And so I think, you know, recognizing that, you know, there is a specialty in taking care of patients with thyroid cancer and, and recognizing that patients are probably going to be best served by somebody who does a large volume of thyroid cancer surgery. Greg, do you have any comments? Yeah, that, yeah that's a, I, I would say the answer to Louise's question is honesty. 
you know, that an honest assessment of what we are currently doing, that should be fairly motivating. I mean, I think Rebecca's study is fairly motivating in that regard, right? And, and I, I would say that that means that some of the standard things we do aren't working well, right? Open standard neck surgery. This was not transoral. This was not transaxillary. This was directly standard approach resulted in, you know, nerve and parathyroid problems that were fairly significant. I, and so I would say that we need things other than, you know, to visual, well, I visualize the nerve. Well, maybe monitoring in addition would be helpful. You say, well, I do a capsule of dissection. That's how I preserve parathyroids. Well, that doesn't seem to be working very well. So maybe we need autofluorescence or ICG or some new technologies. Our brain and our hands are giving us these rates of complications. And so perhaps our brain and our hands adequately treated with appropriate technologic embellishments might allow us to get to a new plane of reduced complications. I think so. I think just related to that too, and, and it wasn't covered in this, but some of the data we've gotten from this and the interesting thing is, is even though these patients had complications, the other thing we found is that they actually tolerated it incredibly well. And I think that that just sort of reflects that part of this is appropriate patient education and support, that they understand what to expect, when things happen, how to manage it. Um, we just published the impact of hypoparathyroidism on patients and, and thought it was sort of surprising that it really had no negative impact on their quality of life and that the patients knew what to expect, felt supported, understood how to do it, and felt like it was totally manageable with appropriate support. So I do think part of this is obviously preventing the complications in the first place, but I think there's also uh, a message that we as providers need to do a better job preparing patients and educating them and supporting them in the perioperative period. Great, great answers. Um, could you comment on the decision to do unilateral versus bilateral central neck? How do you make that decision? Obviously here you're talking about um, prophylactic, but if you do have um, clinically evident nodes on the side of your index lesion in the thyroid, um, when do you um, when do you make this, this the decision to go to the other side of the central compartment? Um, so for me, I, I like Dr. Randolph. Uh, I'm very reliant on imaging. I do all my own ultrasounds, and I feel very comfortable doing a nodal assessment with uh, an ultrasound. And so, if I do not see any disease in the central neck component, you know, compartment on ultrasound, and I would say that I think my sensitivity to see a node is down to the you know three millimeter range on ultrasound. I would not go do a bilateral. <laughs> If I see disease there, then I would do a bilateral. Um, the only exception would be a really low line thyroid where you don't have good imaging up front and there's you know, significant disease in one central neck. I might consider just doing a bilateral knowing that surveillance of that other you know, compartment is gonna be difficult. And if there's significant disease on one side, it's likely there's a minimum microscopic disease on the other. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that one of the things I'm proudest about for that 2015 ATA guidelines is the recognition that a central neck includes prelaryngeal, pretracheal, and, and only has to include one paratracheal dissection because the real bad problems come from aggressive bilateral paratracheal dissection. All the really bad things, bilateral cord paralysis, permanent hypopara reside in the bilateral aggressive paratracheal dissection. So even like with medullaries or with PTCs, I, I kind of usually try and envision the cases. There's a tumor side where I'm trying at best I can to preserve the nerve and I care a little bit less about the parathyroids and I'm taking the nodes out. And then there's a non-tumor side where you try and just abide by the thyroid and leave the rest of the paratracheal as best as you can. You don't always get that, right? There can be bilateral bulky paratracheal disease. And in that circumstance, you know, who said we have to do both paratracheal dissections the same day? That's the way we're all trained, but maybe it's smarter to stage the central neck and do it with delay to allow the first side to recover both nerve and parathyroid. Staging advanced bulky nodal disease in the central neck is a very excellent tool and can be used. Uh, it's a matter of preparing the patient preoperatively.
Rebecca, let's, I just want to finish. We've got a, a very um, short time left. Uh, you mentioned nothing about um, the role of parathyroid autotransplantation um, in this study. Could you just comment on that? Was that um, used? That's, really? Yeah, that's obviously standard practice uh, that we would preserve the parathyroids in situ whenever possible, but if they're removed, we would do an autotransplant. And so all the specimens were examined before they went off. And if there was any parathyroid tissue identified, it was auto-transplanted. Um, and so we didn't report that, but that was standard practice. And I think that that should be standard practice. I think even if you're confident you saw all four parathyroids, you should still look at every specimen carefully. Um, nothing bothers me more than when a pathology report says there's an incidental parathyroid found. To me, that's a failure of the surgeon. Um, we should be identifying those and auto-transplanting them. Terrific. Listen, um, I'd like to thank both of you for a really outstanding discussion. I'd like to then thank all of our attendees for uh, joining us this morning. Um, this was uh, a wonderful um, discussion and a, an outstanding stu study that was conducted um, by Rebecca. And so congratulations on that. I just want to remind everyone that um, on Monday, this discussion will be um, available as um, uh, for you in our library of these journal clubs that you'll be able to access. You'll receive notification of that. And so if any of your colleagues or trainees were not available, um, please encourage them, uh, not available this morning, please encourage them to, um, uh, to log on and watch that. So once again, everybody, um, thank you for joining us and uh, everybody stay safe and hope to see you again next week.